Hi, Cross Point Wesleyan Church. It's Pastor Susan. It's great to see you today. Uh, remember the giving tree? We went ahead and started putting that up last week, and so there's a couple angels left. If you've taken anything, return it by the 22nd of December, so that way we can go and give it to the kids and be able to process this. I want to appreciate everybody for doing the giving tree this year. Uh, we changed things up a little bit just because of we're trying to work with COVID and all, but uh, we will be sponsoring a party for them, but we're not going to be there. So they're still going to celebrate Christmas and have the gift bags that Pastor Tyler and Bree set up for the kids. So they're going to start hopefully connecting with us that way. So pray for them. Celebrate Recovery is still happening on Monday nights. Uh, it's here at 7 o'clock it starts. So please uh, come. It's great. We were talking about, you know, our, we all have ha hang-ups and habits and things that we have to work on. So uh, please come. It, it, you know, it's really good. Gary Swain is doing a great job leading, and you get a lot of insights about yourself. So we would love to have you here. Also, we will be doing a Christmas Eve service this year, live and in, live in person at 6 o'clock. But we also will have it online, available on YouTube and Facebook. So have a great day. God bless. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye. Good morning, Cross Point Church. Please join us in singing our first Christmas carol today, The First Noel.
I'm just so very grateful to the Lord God that when he sent Jesus to the world, he sent him on a mission. Jesus came not just to hang out with us, but to be our Messiah. And I'm so very, very grateful for the fact that Jesus is indeed our Messiah. He came to rescue us from our sins. He came with a mission in mind. And so often we love to think about Jesus, the baby in a manger and how beautiful that scene is when he is given to us. But folks, he hung on a cross and he knew from the beginning before he left heaven that that's what he would do and that's what it would take to save us. Let's worship and praise the Messiah.
Church, if you would bow your heads with me as we pray. God, I just thank you so much for this day that we have, and we do, we just lift you up that you are the Messiah. We praise you today, Father, that you have already saved us from our sins, from the mistakes and the, and the decisions we made in our past, but also the ones we will make in the future, God. And I thank you today that you not only saved us from something, you saved us for a purpose, God. I thank you, Father, that you call us in to be a part of your plan of reaching our community and loving other people. And, and this Christmas, we celebrate the fact that you came to us. We celebrate that, Father, as we continue to lift you up. I pray that you'll be with my dad, Pastor Ken, as he preaches today and he shares the good news, God, that you came and you have a good word for us, even in the midst of the season where so many are afraid. And in Jesus' name, we say together, amen. amen. Thank you, church, so much for worshiping with us today, and I hope you enjoy the day's sermon. Good morning. I may look like a new face to you, and I am a new face around here. I am Pastor Tyler's father, and my wife Darlene, Tyler's mother, um, and I moved to Pennsville recently, and we will be worshiping here with you. Um, I've been a pastor for many, many years, and I'm sort of in semi-retirement. And again, you'll be seeing me around here. And it's so good to be here, and thank you so much for joining us today. I want to get right into our message this morning, and I want to begin by reading a passage of Scripture to you. There's a few verses that I would like for us to look at. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and gave him the name Jesus. More than 10 years ago now, my wife and I were in the town of New Bern, New, uh, North Carolina. We were vacationing together, and as I recall, it was a great vacation. We were having a wonderful time. One particular day was a beautiful day as we woke up, so we decided we were going to take about an hour drive, go to the uh, Atlantic Ocean to swim and to enjoy the beach. I enjoy swimming, um, body surfing, body boarding uh, in the ocean. I always have loved it. I grew up close enough to the beach where I got there enough, so this is something that I've always enjoyed. And after coming in for, from having some fun in the water together, we went and sat on a blanket that we had spread out there on the sand. We just uh, were enjoying it. I, I slipped on my sunglasses and I decided just to soak in some of the sun. And I laid back just to soak in the warmth and to enjoy it and to dry off. Well, I have a hyperdoodle mind. And so it just goes and goes and it kicked in. And so I decided that I wanted something from out of our beach bag. And I got up and I began to rummage through the bag. 
while I'm rummaging through the bag and I got whatever it was that I wanted, I think probably a snack knowing me, uh, once I got that done, it occurred to me as I was uh, rummaging that I wanted to speak to the lifeguard about something. I had some questions and that's kind of who I am. I talk to a lot of people. So I jumped up from uh, my spot of rummaging and, and walked up to the lifeguard stand and began to talk to him. And I noticed when I was talking to him, he sort of had a look on his face like he was puzzled with me. But I carried on the conversation. I had my questions answered. I felt good about that. And I headed back to the blanket to where my wife was. And I sat down. As I sat down and we began to talk, she looked at me and suddenly burst out laughing uncontrollable. She was not able, she was laughing so hard that she was not even able to speak. She was coughing and gasping for air and I the whole time am sitting here clueless as to why she thinks whatever it is is funny is so funny. And I kept asking her, why are you laughing? What are you laughing at? And finally, in weakness, she raises her finger and points to me. And I still was a little bit clueless as to what was going on. But um, here is a picture that will explain everything for you. See, I didn't know that when I was rummaging in that beach bag, my lens for my sunglasses fell out. So I had one, one lens in and one out. This is how the lifeguard saw me, and this is how my wife saw me when I came back, and to her, it was hysterical. She laughed so hard that she couldn't even speak. It was so funny to her. Have you ever felt like you've been left out of the loop? Like someone is, something is happening, and everybody else around you knows what it is, but you, don't, you didn't get the memo, so you don't have a clue? Everybody gets the joke but you? A plan is afoot and no one cued you in? That's kind of how I felt. But how difficult do you think it must have been for Joseph to be told by his fiance that she was pregnant? How difficult was that moment when she was explaining to him that although she was pregnant, she is, was still a virgin? How hard would it have been as she is explaining to him that she had been visited by an angel who had prophesied the coming of the Messiah. Talk about being out of the loop. What a shock for Joseph, because he was anticipating the typical marriage and the typical engagement period, and he gets hit with this. So he is still reeling, still trying to take in what Mary has told him. He has walked away from her, and he is still wrestling on how to best handle what must have been for him a scenario that he never dreamed he would be dealing with. I'm sure he was exhausted that night when he went to bed. It must have been such a hard night for him, and he probably didn't easily go to sleep. But our scripture lesson tells us that while he did sleep, Joseph was visited by the angel, God's angel who said to him, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Our sermon series for this Christmas season is Fear Not. Pastor Tyler pointed out that in preparation for the Messiah to come into the world, the Son of God to come into the world, that God sent out angels to deliver messages to key people that he was going to work through, that he would use in bringing Jesus into the world. And Pastor Susan did a wonderful job speaking to us about Mary's experience with the angel Gabriel. Each time an angel appeared to a human being, they were encouraged by the angel to fear not. Pastor Tyler pointed out, that when an angel was sent out, an angel would begin usually their conversation with someone would fear not. Now I wanna stress to you that some angels, for example, Gabriel, are incredibly powerful beings. And just the sight of certain angels is intimidating. Some of them are huge 
And so feeling fear of an angel is not an abnormal response. In fact, it would be a very normal response. And I have a feeling if you or I had one of the mighty angels of heaven visit us in full manifestation of who they are, it would terrify us. And so that was certainly the response of so many. In the case of jo Joseph, though, I'm not seeing that he was so much afraid of the angel's appearance, but he is instructed by the angel to not be afraid to take Mary as his wife. In other words, don't be afraid, Joseph, to follow God's will and his guidance in your life. As improbable as it appeared, Mary was not lying to Joseph after all. She was still a virgin. Do not be afraid, Joseph, to carry out God's instructions and take her in. Have faith to obey. Let me remind you that Joseph and Mary were just plain, ordinary people like you and I. And they had all of the emotions and weaknesses that we have. As far as I can see, they weren't exceptional people except in their devotion to the Lord God. It's most obvious that these two young people were set on loving and serving and pleasing God. Make mis no mistake though, they were just people and they were flawed. Some all but consider Mary divine, but she was only a human being. How hard it must have been for Mary to try to explain everything to Joseph and how hard for Joseph to hear it all. So hard, in fact, that he couldn't bring himself to believe her. And he stepped away, walked away from that conversation with, with a heart full of doubt about her. Before we criticize him too much, though, remember, never to that point had there been a virgin birth. And why would God choose a peasant couple to bear and raise the Messiah? Why would he have the Messiah come to a couple that were just getting established and were not wealthy at all? No wonder it took a visit from the angel to convince him that everything he had heard from Mary was true and everything he had heard from Mary was part of God's eternal plan. I love the faith that both Joseph and Mary exhibited. They had the faith to obey God's extraordinary plan. And let me break that down for you just a little bit today. This is no run of the mill type of faith here. You know, the kind of faith that most of us have because that kind of faith would have failed them. I'm just telling you it would have happened. This is a level of faith that, that is so rare in the last days that Jesus would ask the question when he returns, will he find any such faith on earth? And frankly, I'm not sure that he will. Thank God he found it all the first time in Joseph and in Mary. Thank God he found this godly young couple. You see, their faith was a faith that doesn't require to have all of the details. It doesn't require all of the details. The, the experience of both Mary and Joseph was that they were given very little information about God's plan for them. God didn't reveal it all at once to them. Basically, God told them what they needed to know in order to take the first steps of obeying his plan. All that God required of them was for them to trust him and do what he said specifically that day. And for Joseph, the step was to take Mary home as his wife. How many of you would be comfortable in on embarking on a life-altering adventure without hardly any specifics whatsoever, even if you knew it was God's plan? It would not be easy, would it? Please think about this for a moment. Mary and Joseph's plans were probably very similar prior to the angels showing up in their lives, very similar to many young engaged couples. They would marry. Joseph would work very hard to make a living 
and Mary would work very hard to provide a good home. They would have children and they would bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Before they were even married, without warning, Gabriel, the angel of God, showed up to Mary and told her that she has been chosen by the Lord God to give birth to the Savior of the world. And she's told very little more than that. She has to break the news to her betrothed. Her incredible response to all of this is found in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me as you have said. What a powerful response of faith by Mary. So with just very few details, Mary gave up her dreams and ambitions and surrendered to the plan of the Lord God. Now Joseph had just arrived to probably the most difficult and hurtful decision of his life and somehow, after probably some restlessness, managed to go to sleep. He just wasn't able to believe Mary's remarkable explanation for being pregnant. So he was going to quietly divorce her in an attempt to avoid disgrace and shame for Mary and her family. Again, though, without warning, an angel came to Joseph in a dream, and he confirmed God's plan for Joseph, for Mary, and most importantly, for Jesus. Verse 24 of our scripture lesson tells us that Joseph simply woke up and did what he was told. He took Mary home to be his wife. Neither Mary nor Joseph knew much about God's plan, but they knew their God, and that was enough. They knew the plan was God's will, and that was enough for them. Over and over, they demonstrated the same kind of obedient, unquestioning faith in their God. It didn't get easy. The plan of God wasn't something that was simple for them. Matthew chapter 2 tells us about Magi who came to worship Jesus and how the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph uh, in the night in a dream again to warn him to immediately get up and get his family out of there and go to Egypt to escape the, the uh, tyrant Herod who was, would be out to kill Jesus. And the couple did exactly as they were told did not know everything when they acted, but they obeyed anyway. It's how God usually deals with people, by the way. We're not given the plan of God from A to Z. I think many of us would be so frightened by the, com the completeness of God's will for our lives that we might run the other way. We would prefer to know everything first, though, wouldn't we? We want to know all of the facts and then figure out how we're going to proceed. More times than not, that's what church boards try to do. That's what church committees try to do. They gather as many of the facts and all the information and variables as possible, and then they make a decision uh, about whether or not to move forward with an idea. And it's more comfortable that way. And frankly, I think whenever it is possible to do that, especially for a board or committee, it is a good thing to consider the cost and all of the variables. It's good wisdom to do so. Sometimes, though, God does not provide his plans in great detail to men. I'm reminded in the Old Testament of a man by the name of Abraham. And God one day just spoke to him and said, Abraham, leave where you're living and go in that direction. And when you get there, I'll let you know. And that is what Abraham did on faith. Left everything and everyone that he loved behind and he made, made his way in a direction until God settled him in a land. Sometimes we are on a need to know basis with God and we're called upon by God to trust in him, that he loves us, that he will care for us, and that we don't need to know everything he knows. He's God. He does not have to consult any of us before he makes a plan, before he proceeds with a plan. Often, he will reveal just enough for us, just enough of his will to get a person started and then he tells the person, trust in me as I lead you. 
That's the kind of faith that Mary and Joseph expressed on very little detail. They accepted the will of God for them. On very little detail, they embarked by faith on a life that they did not expect. Chuck Swindoll has said, your faith ought to get you in trouble at times. If everybody thinks you're a nuts, you may be. It's okay if some think you are. You're probably in trouble if no one thinks you are. In his book, God Came Near, Max Lucado wrote a chapter called Limb Climber or Branch Setter, or Branch Sitter, I should say. That's in chapter five of his book. Pastor Max does a masterful job at directing his readers to see the courage and faith it takes to leave what is safe and familiar and go climb out on a limb for God. Have you ever been there? Has God ever laid it on your heart to give something that would make others think, well, that's nuts. You shouldn't be giving that. But instead, you gave because he urged you to. You went out on a limb. Have you ever ventured into a ministry endeavor or a ministry opportunity that others would consider kind of nuts, but on God's urgent, you went and did it anyway? That's the kind of faith that Joseph and Mary had. That's what they did. That's part of the abundant life experience, brothers and sisters. And by the way, that's the miracle zone. Joseph and Mary's faith was a faith that doesn't stall. I believe Joseph and Mary had the option to turn away from God's plan. Either one of them, I believe, could have said, no, God, I'm, I'm out. They may have refused the Lord. And I don't think God was going to force them to take on this responsibility. It's interesting to think about how others may have responded to this call. Some would have flat out refused. I think a lot of people would have. Others might have pried the Lord very hard to see if they could get more information before they consented. And I think some would have just flat out stalled. They may have eventually been willing to do it, but in their own timing. Before we had our pet dog, Zoe, the one we now have, our family dog was a little long-haired chihuahua by the name of Rocket. He had a bad habit of stalling on me, and I didn't like that at all. If he was outside barking at nothing in particular, and I would go to the door to call him in, he sometimes really didn't want to come in because he wasn't finished barking at nothing in particular. Sometimes he just wanted me to leave him out there and let him voice all of the dog language that he wanted to voice. On those occasions, if I were to do what he wanted me to do, I was to wait there until he decided that he was okay with coming back in, at which point he would begin to scratch at our door and whine until I would let his highness step in the house again. And I, my deal was, I own him, and he doesn't run my life, I run his. So as far as I was concerned, as the owner, I decided when it was time for him to stop barking at nothing in particular and to come in. And I wanted him to come running when I called him. I want my dogs to be obedient, always have felt that way, but Rocket didn't think so. If I went to the door and I called him to come in and he didn't think it was the appropriate timing, he wasn't ready to come in, if, if that happened, he would stare at me as if he were trying to say to me, you're making a mistake. I'm, I'm looking at you, you're calling me, I'm looking at you because for me it's not time. I'll come in, but I want to come in later. That's when I would begin to use what I call my command voice. It would be pretty pronounced and there would be some volume to it and I would shout out, not shout, but pretty much push out volume and say, Rocket, come. And at that, I would expect him to come for me. When I would issue that command, there would be times when he would begin the stalling tactics. 
First, again, he would stare at me for probably 30 more seconds as I repeated it over and over. Rocket, come, come here, come. And I had to do that to even get him to begin to move. And when he did move, if he didn't want to come in, he would not run. He would move like a sloth does. He had this whole, this whole routine of one little step at a time, ears kind of flattened down, tail tucked way in, because he did not want to come. And then he would begin to walk this very slow walk, and finally he would make it to the door. Now, the odd thing about this is while he was walking, I had to keep saying, Rocket, come, come now, come. If I stopped, he made the assumption I no longer wanted him to come. At least that's how he acted, and he would just stop and begin to go away again. So I would have to do this until His Highness would reach the door. Well, that was frustrating to me, and I would get annoyed at him, and I would want to just grab him and spank him. I wouldn't do it because he was a little chihuahua, and I'm not a violent person against a dog, so when he would get to the door, I was usually hoarse, I was usually frustrated with him, and so I would usually, when he got to the door, use my foot to push him the rest of the way in the house. I would not kick but I would sweep him into the house. And when I did that, His Highness would holler out as if I were beating him severely. Somehow, I think that little dog knew that I would get scolded by you know who uh, if I were to do any kind of harm to the little thing. And so he would holler as if I had hit him and I would get in trouble. But oh, I hated it when he stalled. He stalled, I got mad, he stalled, I got in trouble. You know, sometimes people try to stall with God. And what I mean is some people can get a clear call from the Lord and they can know that God has something he wants of them. And instead of obe obeying immediately, there's this stalling tactic. They know enough to know what their next step requires, but instead of just taking the first step that they know God wants them to take, they stall. They want to talk about it. They want to pray about it. They want to ask others' opinions on it. They want to give God time to change his mind. And the whole time, the unmistakable voice of God is calling and the call isn't changed, and it is not rescinded. I think there have been some people, though, who have stalled and then, while they stalled, missed an opportunity. I think blessings were missed. And sadly, I think that there were, there were great things God wanted to do through somebody, but they just stalled so long that they missed the window. I think some have paid a price for stalling, and I think that people have, have suffered as a result of God's person stalling. The beauty of Joseph and Mary and their faith is that each of them acted immediately after they knew what God's will was for them. When God gave them a step to take, they obeyed. They had bold obedience. They didn't stall. They didn't delay. Their attitude was they were servants of the Lord God, and they simply did what it was that they knew God wanted them to do. I think the kingdom of God could use a lot more of that kind of obedience, that kind of faith. Joseph and Mary's faith was a faith with no conditions. Joseph and Mary embraced God's plan with all that they were, the moment that they said yes, there was no turning back for them. They were fully committed to God's plan. They were fully committed to their relationship with their God. And they were going to fully rely on God to lead them, guide them, provide for them, protect them, and use them. That's real faith. Again, can I remind you that they already did know that they would be parenting the Messiah. What a terrifying prospect that would be for me. I know how flawed I am. 
I know how many mistakes I have made. If you want to know about some of them, talk to Pastor Tyler. I know that I would feel absolutely inadequate to be a parent to the Messiah, to God's one and only Son. They did what God would have them to do, and they didn't put any conditions on it. They had real faith. And it turns out that God's plan for Joseph and for Mary was challenging. You see, God's plan led them to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem, some 70 miles, as the crow flies, for a government-ordered census. And remember, at that point, Mary was at the very end of her pregnancy and actually delivered the night that they arrived in Bethlehem. And I'm sure it wasn't any kind of fun riding on the back of an animal while having contractions. And of course, we all know that God's plan was for the baby not to be born in a palace or even a nice home. The baby would be born in a stable. Jesus would be laid down in a manger, a feeding trough, wrapped in rags. That was God's plan. Merely eight days after Jesus was born, they're back in, they're in Jerusalem, and the boy was taken to the temple to have him circumcised and named. And they hear a prophecy, Joseph and Mary hear a prophecy, that their son would cause the rising and falling of many in Israel, and a sword would pierce their own souls too. And after traveling back to their hometown, in a few years, two years or so, inside of two years, they would be visited by the Magi. Three kings who, who brought gifts as they worshiped Jesus. And they were given very nice gifts for Jesus. And thank God they were because that very night, Joseph was warned again by an angel in a dream that he had to get up right away and take his family to Egypt to escape King Herod because King Herod had a plot, had it in his mind to kill their son because he knew that the son was to be the king of kings. That journey was about 200 miles. You get in the picture? It was all in the first couple of years after Jesus' birth and there were so many other parts of the, God's plan for their life that was so difficult. And some 30 years later, Mary would be weeping at the foot of the cross, watching her son die. What I love about Mary and Joseph is that they just obeyed. And I know with the pain came such reward. With the, the difficulties came so many blessings. They just believed the word of the Lord and they acted in obedience to his word and followed his plan. The Bible is brutally honest in telling what people did and what they said. So when Moses stalled at his calling and tried to get God to find someone else, it's there. It's in the Bible. When Jeremiah complained to the Lord that the Lord had deceived him, it's in there. When David lusted after another man's wife and committed adultery with her and then uh, killed her husband and stole his wife, that's in the Bible. You know what? I don't see Joseph or Mary ever arguing with God. I don't see them stalling. I don't see them complaining to God about how hard it was. What I see is them trusting God and obeying him. They were committed to obey God. They were committed to follow the plan and the guidance of their God. I want you to consider the following statement, please. If God is going to do something amazing in my life, I have to trust and obey him too. God has a plan for you. I don't care what your name is. I don't care how old you are, your race, your ethnicity. None of that is important because God loves you no matter who you are. And I repeat, he has a plan for you. He knows your name. He knows your heart. If you follow his plan, you will live an abundant life. That I promise you. If you follow God's plan, that's what is in store for you. If you follow your own plan, you won't live an abundant life. 
God's plan includes eternal life for you after this one is over and after you are done here on earth. Left only to your own plan, you will not have eternal life. So let me ask you, are you committed to God's plan for your life? Will you have the faith to obey God? The kind of faith, the extraordinary faith that Joseph and Mary showed? Are you demanding details from God? Are you currently stalling on something you know that God wants you to do right now? Are you holding back? Are you a Christian, but you know that God is requiring something of you that you don't want to give, you don't want to do, so you're stalling and hoping that God will change his mind? Do not be afraid, Joseph. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. It's God's will. This is God's doing. I want to say to any of you, do not be afraid of what God wants for you. He promised us that his plans are for, for not to harm us, but to bring us hope and a future. It's a plan to bless us. And God has such a plan for your life. If you are not born again, that is, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and have not yielded to God's plan for you, I want you to know that he is poised this very moment to forgive you, to make you his very own, and to help you embark on his will for your life. If you are born again and you know you're saved, but you are balking at God's will. Today is your opportunity to stop that and to take the steps that God has laid upon you. You may have to ask him to forgive you and move forward. I pray that you will do so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, O oh God, that you love us, that there's not a human being alive that you do not know and that you do not love. Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to the world so that there would be a way made for human beings to be made your children. Thank you that Jesus came. I thank you that he is the Messiah and the only way to heaven. And I pray specifically for anyone who has not yet trusted Christ and given their lives to your plan. I pray, Father, that they will cry out to you now, that they will confess that they are a sinner, that Jesus is the Messiah, and that they desired to belong to God, to be the child, a child of God. I pray, Father, you would give them forgiveness as they ask for it, and that you would bring them into the kingdom. And I pray for any Christian who's been stalling and struggling with something you want from them, and they have not obeyed your plan. Give them faith to obey. In fact, give us all that faith. Thank you again, Lord, for your love. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today.